Welcome to this video on biomedical instrumentation. In the previous class, the previous video, we were looking at the various sources of noise. And what are the types of noise? For example, thermal noise, short noise, one over F noise, interference, power line interference, for example. And we also said that sometimes one over F noise can represent a physiological phenomenon, in which case it becomes a signal if you're interested in that physiological phenomenon. Or motion artifacts. Because of the movement of electrodes, your measured potential varies. It's called as a motion artifact. And uh, we looked at the example. It's a very unique example of the pacemaker. We looked at that in the previous class. But this video, we look at ways in which you can reduce the noise. What are the various ways in which you can reduce noise? Why do you even need to do this? Because you are interested in reliably measuring physiological signals. You are interested in accurately measuring physiological signals. This effective noise reduction is absolutely critical. So we can have accurate and reliable physiological measurements. What are these techniques? improve noise performance first is you need to avoid artifacts you need to prevent noise at source i mean this is not always possible but if possible you must do it you need to minimize artifacts you, you need to minimize movements while the person is taking eeg you should request the participant or the patient to make Minimal movements are stay still. It is not always possible. But if possible, then they must stay still so that you can minimize motion artifact. But then again, I just mentioned in the previous class, there is blood movement, eye blinks. These are unavoidable. And some things you can avoid. Of course, you can request the patient to not blink for so long. It is possible to for a person to not blink for some duration of time, but not forever. For example, if you are interested in conducting an audiometry test, it is best to conduct this test in a room that is soundproofed. You can also provide shielding to the cables and instruments to minimize electromagnetic interference. So that will reduce the amount, but it will not actually remove. So you are minimizing the interference or noise at the source. The other is to identify and remove noise in the signal after acquisition. First is to remove it at the source. The second is to remove it after acquiring. This might mean that you can filter or you can use thresholding or you can use some relatively complicated advanced signal processing tools and complex algorithms. The other is filtering. This is the most basic and fundamental tool signal processing tool that essentially means you are selectively passing or attenuating signals depending on their frequencies. Note that sometimes your noise source will also have the same frequency. I mentioned this previously. I will say this again because this is the critical design element that you will have to learn. How do you design a system that will have High signal to noise ratio is a critical design concept. And you're interested in separating the desired signal from noise because physiological signals sometimes occupy, not sometimes, always occupy specific frequency ranges. So you can use that to filter out noise. What are the various types of filters? You know, these are some of the passive filters. I expect the students of this course to know how these filters work because i expect the students of this course to have undergone a basic course in electrical circuits okay? if not you can learn by reading basic textbooks on electrical circuit theory so you have a low pass filter which filters which allows frequency below a particular cutoff frequency to pass but does not allow frequencies above that frequency to pass. 
frequency. That means low pass. It allows frequencies below a value of frequency to go to the output. Other frequencies are removed. This is useful if your noise is having a higher frequency. Then you have high pass filters. This one allows frequencies above a cutoff frequency to pass and uh, attenuates or prevents frequencies below a particular, below that cutoff frequency to pass. How does this uh, each of these circuit work as a low pass and high pass filters? What is the science behind this? What is the physics behind this? Please check and learn from your basic circuit theory. Now, high, high pass filters may be very useful to remove drift or slowly changing artifacts. Because usually, physiological signals will have a minimum frequency range. But that's not always true. For example, ECG signals usually also have a slow varying component. So you cannot always use this. But EMG, for example, has frequencies only about 20 hertz. So that means then I can use a high pass filter to remove any motion artifact that is below 10 hertz. Motion artifacts usually are slow varying signals below 5 hertz, for example. Then there are band pass filters. These allow frequencies within a particular range to pass, but uh, stop or reject values outside of this range. So this is useful to restrict frequencies, restrict signals to a particular frequency range or a band of frequencies. So for example, I'm interested in a particular physiological rhythm. Then you have band stop filters and band reject filters or notch filters. This attenuates frequencies within a range, but allows frequencies outside this range. It is very frequently used, almost always used to remove power line noise because you're, uh, for example, in India, power line has the frequency of 50 hertz. Almost always any measurement has this 50 hertz noise. But what if your signal also has the 50 hertz component? That means then you cannot know what that 50 hertz component in your signal represents because you, if you have rejected it using the band reject or the notch filter. These are the textbooks that we'll be using for our, this course, Tatsuo Togawa, Biomedical Instrumentation by uh, R.S. Kanpur and Webster. So with this, we come to the end of this week's uh, video. Thank you very much for your attention.